If you enjoy my videos, please check out my website at creationsciencefiction.com where you'll find articles on creationism, science, and my blog. If you really enjoy what I'm doing, please consider becoming a contributor at the link in the video description. Welcome to Educate for Life Online. This is the fourth class in our course, Created on Purpose or Evolved by Chance. Today we're going to be talking about dating methods, as in how old is the Earth and how do we know? All right, today I'm here with Kevin Donahue from Houston, Texas. And Kevin is a petroleum geologist and geophysicist. And how you doing, Kevin? Tell us a little bit about your, your career. I'm doing great, Bill. Uh, it's nice to be here with you today. Uh, coming to you from Houston in my flooded home, which is why you see my my uh, part of my son's uh, bedroom posters here. Um, so my career has been uh, as a geologist and a geophysicist in the oil and gas business. Started my career uh, doing exploration, um, an oil finder, uh, then switched to the uh, vendor side of the business and got involved in technology creation and marketing. And so I've designed some software that was used uh, more than any other in the industry for seismic interpretation. Also helped design software that's been used for uh, so-called basin modeling, which is a, a quantitative way of modeling when petroleum is generated, under which circumstances, and how to find it on that basis. That's awesome. So, you know, today we're going to be taking a look at, uh, this is the Age of the Earth Part 4, um, Kevin Conover's online course on creationism. This is actually the 14th video in that series, and we got a ways to go. Uh, he, he put out a lot of material. So um, let's take a look at what he says about the geologic comment, column, and then we'll make some comments. Sounds good. You've probably heard of the geologic column. The geologic column is something that evolutionists came up with to try to say that the different strata that we see in the layers of the earth represent different uh, time frames in which things evolved. So the lower you go down in the strata, the lower uh, evolved creatures you have. The higher up you go in the strata, the higher uh, level animals you have. So humans are at the top, um, then you have animals at the very bottom, like single-celled organisms and so forth. Now that's their argument. Of course, as a Bible-believing Christian, we know that the layers, the strata that are all over the planet Earth were laid down by the flood. All right, well, what did you think of that? I mean, he, uh, he kind of got that all wrong. It doesn't really have anything to do with um, lower animals or less evolved animals at the bottom and more evolved animals at the top. That was crazy. Um, yeah, there's... There's certainly a lot we could nitpick with that, <laughs> and and that that is uh, that's certainly part of it. Um, you know, indicates directionality and evolution, which we know is is in fact not the case. Probably be more accurate to have said more derived. That that's that's uh, uh, that's probably a more accurate. But you know, he gets some generalities correct there. Um, he does indicate that uh, that. Uh, you know, you've got stuff that's older at the bottom and, and younger on the top, and that's certainly an element of what the geologic column is. So I don't have a problem with, with that. Um, it, he did refer, of course, to evolutionists. Uh, Darwin's uh, book it had not even been published when the vast majority of the geologic column had been worked out. So that, that's really just, once again, trying to smear uh, geology by referencing the people who do it as evolutionists. Right. The geologic column is is how the layers relate to each other. And originally, I mean, it wasn't so much an, as assigning age as it was assigning where in the column they were. I mean, and they really they kind of knew they didn't have, um, you know, ages on a lot of that, yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, but that's exactly right. We can take this conversation in a lot of different directions, but um, the, the geologic column was assembled piecemeal. That's the first thing to understand. So when you hear a, uh, a creationist sort of derisively say, well, this was assembled piecemeal, you can't find it any place, uh, there is absolute truth to that. So it began uh, with the first definition of the part of the geologic column was in the mid 1700s. The very most recent, the quaternary part of the geologic column was first defined in, uh, in the Po Valley in Italy. And it took 125 years roughly until the very last one of the geologic periods were described and assembled into what we now call the geologic column. So what is the geologic column? 
geologic column is simply the representation of the passage of geologic time from the time that the earth was formed until today and its subdivision into different named units. There was no association of absolute time or numerical time, as you as you pointed out. The techniques to uh, determine what those, those numerical ages were didn't exist at that time. There were plenty of people attempting to come up with the estimates, but it wasn't until the 20th century that the geologic column with all of its various names had been associated with a numerical time scale. Right. And another thing to remember is it's a collection of data. It doesn't have to exist anywhere in the world at when one place, the entire thing for it to be a useful tool for geologists. That's exactly right. So coming back to my comment about it being assembled piecemeal. So in fact, what you had were the early geologists who were defining basically individual periods in the 12 periods that now form the Phanerozoic part of the geologic column. Everybody's heard of the Precambrian. The Precambrian is basically everything that happened before the Phanerozoic. It's also subdivided into periods. We won't get into those. The vast majority of that has nothing to do with fossil life. The Phanerozoic um, is something entirely different. What these early geologists noted was that not rock type, but fossil content helped them to determine uh, a, a succession of rocks that they would give a name to, such as Quaternary or Permian or whatever. And this was done in isolation of workers anywhere else on the globe. In the 1800s, of course, there weren't that many people doing this type of work. Mm. And it really mainly started in Europe. And so you had people defining something in England uh, and then people independently defining something somewhere else in another part of, the, of Europe. And when they got together, they determined, hey, we're seeing the same succession of fossils here, even though in some cases the rocks didn't look exactly the same doesn't have to be a sandstone here and a sandstone there with the same same fossils. And when they started to look at this very closely, they determined that they could correlate these rocks from continent to continent. The same thing happened in, in North America once you got enough geologists working in North America. So the prediction became, if we see this locally here in, or regionally here in Europe, it's starting to feel like this is a global phenomenon, that we can count on unique fossil assemblages, in some cases index fossils, very specific fossils, to help us determine which rocks correlate in time around the globe. Now, you can think of that as a very large scale hypothesis, right? So this is what we expect. Now, when we go somewhere else, will we see it again? They kept seeing it on the surface. But what they'd never found, as you alluded to, they never found a place where the entirety of the Phanerozoic is located on the surface. Completely unsurprising to geologists because there is such a thing as erosion and uplift. So things are constantly being eroded away. We don't expect to find everything in one place. Now, that brings us to the, 19, the, the 20th century. Once we started drilling deeper and deeper into sedimentary basins around the world to look for oil and gas, we did find basins where the entirety of the Phanerozoic existed in the subsurface, 25 basins around the world. One in the North America is not, not far from you, it's closer to you than it is to me, mm -hmm. as the Williston Basin, okay? So there are places in the world where there is a physical representation of each of the 12 Phanerozoic periods in the subsurface. The subsurface in a sedimentary basin is not undergoing erosion the same way that we see at the surface today. And that's why those rocks are, are there. And what we find is same, same rocks there as are on the surface. We have uh, use the drill bit to prove that, in fact, the geologic column does exist. The pieces that we put together early on fit together the way th that we said that they would, and that this is a global phenomenon. The oil and gas business, anybody using geology uses the geologic column every single day to determine the relative ordering of rocks. It has nothing to do with their absolute age, their numerical age. If we were to determine tomorrow that radiometric dating did not work, the geologic column itself would still exist. You would still have the ordering of the rocks on the basis of their fossil content. And no evidence of a flood. <laughs> uh, and no evidence of a flood. That's a different topic, but the, the succession of the fossils very clearly um, is evidence for evolution um, uh, over time. And no, the flood's a different story, but right. absolutely no evidence for that. All right, let's see what he's got to say next. Okay. The geologic column is often used to try to date the Earth, but the problem is it's circular re reasoning. 
You might ask somebody, how do you know a trilobite is 500 million years old? And by the way, 500 million years is down near the bottom of the geologic column. And your evolutionist might say, look at the geologic column. There it is, trilobite, down at 500 million years old. And then you say, how do you know the geologic column is right? And they say, because trilobites were the first multi-organ creatures to evolve 500 million years ago. Now, if you're clever here, you see the problem. But oftentimes, we get taken uh, by this uh, line of argument, and we think that, oh, wow, there's all this evidence that uh, the Earth really is billions of years old. We come back to the question, how do you know a trilobite is 500 million years old? This is called circular reasoning or begging the question. Look at the geologic column. Now, in each layer in the fossil uh, strata, in the strata, they'll say they have index fossils. That fossil tells us how old the strata is. But the problem is, uh, the fossil tells us how old the strata is, but the strata tells us how old the fossil is. And so you have this just going around in a circle. All right. Well, that was uh, interesting, wasn't it? I mean, trilobites weren't close to the first multicellular or multi. Uh, whatever you said, organisms there. <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. He's not even close. Um, there were a number of, uh, of phyla that uh, made their first appearances in the Cambrian. I mean, they have to appear somewhere, right? But we have multicellular animals, for instance, sponges, um, which were previously thought to have come about in the Cambrian. Uh, we now find um, fossil sponges back to at least uh, 60 million years before the Cambrian started. So uh, part of the issue with uh, with defining the Cambrian as an explosion, um, it, it was a fairly rapid radiation, is the fact that that was a time at which um, the animals themselves were finally able to develop hard parts, which were are, are more easily fossilized. And so the fossil record is skewed by that fact. The earliest multicellular animals had no hard parts. And so the evidence in the fossil record is is much sparser for them for for obvious reasons. Anybody that understands preservation and fossilization, mm -hmm. but yes, multicellular animals go further back than than the Cambrian. He's wrong about trilobites being the first. When somebody gets the basics wrong, you can expect them to get the, the more detailed stuff wrong as well. You've also written some things about. Um, circular reasoning and uh, the fossils dating the rocks and the rocks dating the fossils. I mean, it, it isn't true. I mean, we do use index fossils to give a, uh, an age um, sometimes in layers where we, um, where we, we, you know, that's what we have. I mean, say we got a sedimentary yeah. layer, we don't have any volcanic material. We don't have something else to date it and index layers can be used. I mean, I've gone out here in Arizona and found, I can't remember the name of the species, but there's a sponge that's specific to the, right. the Kaibab limestone here, but it's it's 250 million years old. It's found in Europe at 250 yep. million years old or whatever form it is there. It's the only time that species is found anywhere. So if I'm finding that sponge and I'm finding that layer, I can, I can say that, that layer is probably 250 million years old. However, it, wasn't deter it was determined because in other places, they were able to date that with radiometric dating um, and, or at least sandwich that layer in between two other layers that are datable. You know, so it wasn't a random thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not circular reasoning to do no, that. Not at all. And so let me let me let me take a couple of the things that he said and you've said and discuss them separately, because I, I think in order to understand this for the sort of average guy who's not, not real, real into geology to understand this, we need to take them as separate pieces. So, again, going back to the earlier conversation, geologic column was was defined based on fossil content and also the fact that certain fossils and the rocks enclosing them were found in predictable orders right from from older in other words deeper in a in a local stratigraphic succession to younger or higher in that succession so we've given those those rocks and those those fossils names such as cambrian or ordovician or silurian or whatever with no regard to the absolute age associated with that. Now, we've correlated those around the world. We can map those units physically by walking the contacts between Cambrian and Ordovician, for instance, in certain parts of the world. So we can physically see these are the same 
uh, rocks, same systems with the same fossils. That's how we know that they correlate. Because otherwise, Mr. Conover could 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 be right, right? If we all we had was let's say one outcrop in the United States with this fossil succession, and one outcrop in Europe with this fossil succession, and there were no outcrops anywhere else in the world. With those two data points, it would be very, very difficult to say that those rocks were equivalent time simply because of their fossil content, right? There mm -hmm. could be circular reasoning because you don't have enough data points. Fact is, we have millions of data points. There are outcrops all over the world. We've drilled, I think it's 8 million wells to date around the world uh, in sedimentary basins. Every bit of this information is consistent. We've walked contacts in the field. We've mapped the physical distribution of the fossils and the rocks that contain them around the world. There is absolutely no question that this succession of fossils is as the way uh, geologists first described it over a period of 125 years. And the succeeding 125 years, actually now almost 145 years, we've seen nothing but agreement with the first 125 years worth of work. So those relative successions exist now. In order to call something 50 million years old, we need to be able to date the rocks and then be convinced that the date for rocks that are containing, let's say, a specific trilobite are in fact the same numerical date for the for rocks that are containing that trilobite in some other part of the world. And so really it, it, it really got started in the early 1900s that we started radiometrically dating rocks. The earliest experiments were done by Rutherford. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s, however, that the techniques, the sampling techniques, the laboratory techniques, the instrumentation got good enough that we started to really be able to put together consistent data sets. And so we've seen now for 60, 70 years, there have been hundreds of thousands of analyses of radiometric dates around the world. And what we see in every single case is that the deeper rocks, the stratigraphically deeper rocks, are older than the ones that are that are higher in the column. So even if you didn't pay attention to the to the numerical date, but you just looked at the progression of the dates, you could say this is a technique that seems to be working. But we've also found that when you do date rocks um, by dating, for instance, volcanic rocks or plutonic rocks that intersect fossiliferous rocks, let's say a layer that has a particular trilobite in it, that we get a numerical date that is consistent from one continent to another for those rocks. So this is further clarification that the geologic column itself is correct. It's also further clarification that the, that the numerical dating is meaningful. And so that's what gives us the, the confidence to be able to say, okay, this trilobite over here, we've already dated the rocks associated with that in 50 locations around the world. We know what the, the radiometric dates are associated with it. We can get, we can confidently give an age to those rocks, a numerical age to those rocks. So there is absolutely no circular reasoning. Right. Awesome. That was excellent. Sinclair Oil uses the dinosaur as their mascot. And you'll see on the can here, it says mellowed 80 million years. Does it really take oil 80 million years to come into existence? Oil is made up of dead animals. Coal is made up of dead plants. Okay, so oil is dead animals and coal is dead plants. Well, yeah, that's his that's his first mistake, of course. Uh, I can tell he's not a petroleum geochemist. Um, so uh, again, I have worked in this particular field, my uh, company that I was associated with for many years. We developed software that, uh, in fact, used petroleum geochemistry and an understanding of how sedimentary basins are formed to make predictions with this software about when and where petroleum would form, not just petroleum, but oil versus gas, when it would form, when it would migrate from source rocks, et cetera. So it, it, there's, there's a great deal of science behind this. But one of the things that we know from geochemical work over, over many decades is that in fact, oil is made, both is definitely is derived from living things, formerly living things, oil and gas for that matter. Um, but no, dinosaurs did not make up the, the majority of uh, petroleum deposits found today. The biomass of uh, land animals compared to marine animals is, is just inconsequential. And we know from studying the rocks and the organic matter in them that, in fact, um, you have mostly marine plankton 
that have been involved as in as the organic matter that has ultimately turned into oil and gas. What's the actual? Marine, what, I'm sorry, but what, what's the actual age of most of the oil deposits? That it, are it varies tremendously. So you have source rocks that go back to uh, Paleozoic source rocks. You have Mesozoic source rocks, Cenozoic source rocks. So um, all throughout geologic time, it's not any one particular time. Same thing with coal. You know, a lot of people point to uh, the Carboniferous period in in Europe. They don't distinguish between Pennsylvania and, and Mississippian. Um, we had a lot of coal deposits at that time around the world. It's not globally uh, distributed in the sense of one single layer, but it was a time when climate was such and the distribution of the continents was such that there was a lot of plant material for the very first time on land uh, sufficient to developing ultimately into coal. So Mr. Conover is correct that coal deposits are, are largely made out of land plants, but we also have oil and gas deposits that are made from um, land plant material that's washed into deltas. So you have source rocks that are that come from uh, land-based material. You have source rocks coming from marine-based material. But in, in terms of the amount of petroleum dis distributed worldwide, most of it is associated with marine source rocks. And most of the organic matter that form those marine source rocks is from plankton. It's from microscopic uh, animals and not from dinosaurs. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go on to the next one here. Oil and gas are from organisms that once lived in the sea, changed by heat and pressure into oil. In 1996, a 22.4 million proposal was approved in Western Australia that would build a plant to create oil from sewage sludge in 30 minutes. Anything to oil technological savvy could, could turn 600 million tons of turkey guts and other waste into 4 billion barrels of light Texas crude each year. We duplicated what Mother Nature does, but what Mother Nature took millions of years to do, we do in about 30 minutes. Incredible. It doesn't take millions of years for oil to form. It just takes the right circumstances. And a worldwide flood that wipes out billions of animals all over planet Earth and buries them and then squishes them is just the perfect environment to create oil all over the Earth. Uh, well, I wonder what the chances are that... Uh mother nature could duplicate the process that they use to turn turkey guts into oil. <laughs> well, I guess if we had sufficient turkey guts, um, then, then maybe we could, uh, we had the biomass necessary to, uh, uh, to create the, the vast amount of petroleum reserves that we see uh, around the planet. But, you know, as, as usual with creationist arguments, Mr. Conover um, did provide us with some elements of truth. You can, produce um, in the lab oily-like substances, in other words, uh, hydrocarbons. That does not mean that it's the same geochemistry as the petroleum that we find in the subsurface. In fact, it is not. Petroleum we find in the subsurface oil has a lot of longer chain hydrocarbons that we don't see in some of the stuff that's been produced uh, for commercial purposes, right? So that that's uh, simply a false equivalence there. But um, there certainly is truth and, and value in the fact that we can produce these things at certain temperature ranges in the lab. Geologists have been doing that. Geochemists have been doing that for decades. Uh, there are universities around the world, research institutes around the world that have worked out the temperatures at which the organic matter that we find in the source rocks in the subsurface, the actual organic matter, they find out the temperatures at which oil is created the temperatures at which oil stops generating and instead gas starts to generate. The transitional temperatures where we have um, the liquid gas or liquid gas or condensate, if you will. So with those three basic phases, what we've worked out over a period of decades are the temperature ranges necessary to do that. And it's principally a function of temperature, temperature also being a function of pressure. So it's not the squishing of animals into, into goo that, that, that creates a, uh, that creates petroleum. So the ultimate question is though, how do we find out the conditions in nature that create those temperature ranges? And that's what we use basin modeling uh, technology for. We take the temperature ranges that have been determined in the labs, we create something called kinetics models, which are triggered by these basin models. And what does the basin model do? It simulates through geologic time, 
the deposition and compaction of sediments. Let's say, let's take 10 sedimentary layers, okay? And we deposit the first layer. In other words, the, the layer that it's at the base of that sedimentary basin. And it's not going to be compacted by anything because there's nothing on top of it yet. Now we deposit layer two on top of that. Let's just consider horizontal layers at first. Deposit layer two on top of that. Layer two has a certain weight and it therefore compacts the sediments and the um, pore waters that are beneath it. The result of doing that changes thermal properties in the rocks. This is going to be a lot of complexity, but I'm just going to say it anyway. It changes thermal properties in the rocks that then change the temperature of those rocks. You continue that process through time, and what's happening is the initial rock, layer one, is getting deeper and deeper in the basin over time. It's also getting hotter and hotter, and we can actually model the specific temperatures that it goes through as, as that time progresses. And in there, we can have a source rock. Let's say layer five has organic matter that if it's subjected to the correct temperatures will produce petroleum, oil or gas or whatever in certain quantities. You can actually model the quantities, find out how much it produces, and then ultimately model where the, the, that um, fluid, oil and gas, migrates to in the basin to be found through drilling. Very high technology, um, very complicated processes, there's a tremendous amount of physics uh, behind this. Um, but in doing that, what we have done is validate these same sort of models that, that Mr. Conover is talking about. So we're using those temperatures developed in the lab, and we find when we use those temperatures, we can produce models that then predict on that basis where we're gonna find oil and gas. And what we find is that when you use the numerical dates that have now been associated with the geologic column, that we're able to make accurate predictions. If instead, if we use a young earth and the so-called flood model, where you're depositing hundreds to thousands of sediment, hundreds to thousands of feet of sediment every single day, what you find is that those temperature histories are not the same. And in fact, you would push that source rock, layer number five, through the temperature window at which you would produce oil or gas so rapidly that it can't produce the volumes that we see. Uh -huh. So time has consequences in terms of, not only in terms of producing the temperatures that, that we see recorded in the rocks and the petroleum history, but has consequences in how long the source rock actually sits in the oil or gas window, that temperature window, where it can produce. Because it's not a question of just, it's there for five seconds and it produces all the world's oil. And it doesn't work that way. It needs time. It's like when you cook a pizza, right? You get different results if you cook a pizza for 20 minutes at 350 degrees versus 4 million degrees for one second. It, it has, con temperature has consequences, time has consequences. And that's something that the creationists just don't understand or don't want to understand. In other words, I mean, if this were all laid down at one time 4,300 years ago, like you said, there's just simply not enough time to produce the petroleum in those layers. Exactly right. Because, because the, and it's not because it takes, I, I think that there's, I don't know if it's, if, if it's dishonesty or not understanding the process, but does it take millions of years to produce petroleum? No, you can produce it very quickly under the right circumstances, right? You can, you can start the generation process. You can get a drop of oil quite quickly once the rocks reach the right temperature. What we observe in nature, however, is that it simply takes a long time for rocks to be deposited and compacted into that part of the basin where you get the temperatures that are going to generate petroleum. Uh, those temperatures exist at different depths in different places based on, on basically based on heat flow into the area. You get greater heat flow in certain parts of the world than you do in others. And also based on the rock content itself, the types of minerals that are in the rocks. And yeah, if you don't, if that source rock doesn't sit in the oil and gas window long enough, you cannot yield the volumes of oil and gas that we've actually drilled and produced. It's, there's a, there's a mass and a volume problem. I want to say thank you to Kevin for joining me today. And hey, you and your son are taking up fly fishing, aren't you? We, we've done some fly fishing together a couple of years ago in, uh, in Colorado. It's something I'd like to continue to do. Uh, he, he, and he definitely enjoyed it. Uh, my wife enjoys fishing as well. We haven't been fly fishing together yet, but, uh, 
yeah, one of the days we one of these days we'd like to get back out there. Well, that's awesome. You know, I was a I was a fly tire, professional fly tire for many years, my teens and early twenties. And very cool. Yeah, I did that in in addition to some other things, but but I uh, taught fly fishing and fly tying for years and. I still get out to do it every now and then, a couple, three times a year. Living in Arizona, I don't have the opportunities I did while living right. in Oregon or living in Michigan. But, uh, you know, some of the lakes, in fact, uh, one of the lakes where I discovered tracks, they have uh, some pretty good trout fishing, stock fish, but, you know. I remember some of your pictures from there. And, I, yeah, I, I envy you living someplace close by to where you can do some fly fishing especially as a geologist envy people who live near actual rocks uh the it, it's uh it's tremendous irony that houston being the the uh the capital of the world for geologists we have more geoscientists in houston than the other place on the planet per capita anyway and it's ironic because there's not a rock to be found without a drill bit so everything <laughs> on the surface, there's nothing on the sur surface for us to look at uh, and that that can be depressing. Yep. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks a lot, Bill. Enjoyed All it. Right. Yep.